how to move I feel it in the wind you're about to ride in You said that you would pour your spirit out You said that you would fall on sons and daughters So You would fall on sons and daughters So like the rain Come drench us in love And let your glory Rush in like a flood We are fixed on this one thing To know your goodness See your glory We're transformed by
Good morning, and I greet you in Jesus' name. I am uh, preaching this morning from Gator Wilderness Camp, actually the Hog Bay House, which some of you from Elizabethtown Mennonite Church have actually been part of building. I uh, just want to say it's completed, and uh, it's a great facility for those who would volunteer at the Gator Wilderness Camp School, where my brother Greg is the director. I'd like to begin this morning with a prayer as we get started, since uh, Heidi and I are not together this morning, and uh, I miss her prayers, um, which have empowered me over the years. And I just realize how much her prayers have accumulated over the years, that any prayer we pray goes out into eternity and remains powerful and effective. The scripture says our prayers are effectual. And I'm just aware that Heidi's prayers for me have become more and more effectual as they've accumulated in that place where, God, where our prayers go when they land in God's heart. They have accumulated, and I feel that as I preach. I'm aware of that as I prepare, that so much of what I um, am able to preach and the power by which I preach and the clarity with which I'm hearing God's word these days comes from the fact that Heidi and I are ministering together and that she is my greatest intercessor, my greatest prayer warrior, um, and just uh, the most wonderful partner um, in ministry and spouse that I, wife that I could have. So I just thank God for her and for her prayers, and know that she's praying for me um, even this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you your spirit dwells within all of us who've received you, that there's no mystery here about that. It's not hard to find your spirit. You just couldn't wait to get back to heaven to give us your spirit. And I just pray for all of those who will hear this message um, Sunday morning or some other time, that your spirit would just speak to us, that we would understand that we are no longer orphans, but we are sons and daughters of God, as Paul says. Uh, in, in Galatians 4, that we can just cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, at any moment. And, uh, and, and you are right there with us, that we are just not alone. And so I just pray that the word you've given me this morning and the word that over the years Heidi has prayed for me would just come clearly for me this morning. And I just pray that my heart would be just reside in your heart, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And I do thank you for Heidi, and I thank you for the incredible gift she is to me, and for her prayers and intercession over the years. In Jesus' name, amen. 
I'm in Florida at the Gator Wilderness Camp for the annual uh, reunion of my brothers and uh, we do some fishing when we're together. Some of you are aware that I'm having meniscus surgery on Friday, um, but I just couldn't say no to this trip um, because it is such a grand time that we have together. I love being with my brothers. I'd like to begin this morning by saying that the title has changed, as it so often does for me at the last moment, and the new title is this, Off the Deep End and the Water is Just Fine. Off the Deep End and the Water is Just Fine. I'd like to begin by reading a few verses from Acts 2 and also Ephesians 3. I, I will get to Ephesians 3. Uh, I'm sorry. I'd like to begin by reading some uh, verses from Acts 2, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to take a moment to grab them. Uh, and grab chapter 2 of the book of Acts. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They, see, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all of these men who are speaking Gal Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then Peter goes on to preach this powerful sermon about Jesus Christ and the way Jesus descended, uh, the way Jesus died and rose again for our salvation and ascended into heaven. And he says this, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. There it is. That word that we used last Sunday, that over and over again, the Spirit by Jesus in several places is referred to as the gift of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the complete package. All that we need is going to come, to the, come from the Spirit. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see. And then He goes on and calls them to repent. 3,000 souls are saved. And there's a wonderful description of what the fellowship of believers looks like that probably is where we're going to go next Sunday. What does it mean to reassemble? Why go back to church anyway? I mean, if you can hear me preach anytime you want and see me preach anytime you want, if you can listen to Kate's music anytime you want, if our service is completely packaged, then I don't know why we should go back to church anyway if going back to church is only listening to a sermon and participating in worship or listening to worship. If performance is all that church is, then let's stay home. I mean, we can have coffee and sit in our PJs and do the same deal we did before. But there's got to be more to this. There's got to be more to reassembling. Why come to church anyway? And that's going to be part of our message next week, I think, Acts 2 uh, at the end of the chapter and 4 at the end of the chapter, where we understand that the Holy Spirit came not just for preaching and worship that someone does, but so that we all participate in that together. That when we reassemble as Elizabethtown Mennonite Church, we're going to do so not just to hear a sermon and not just to worship together uh, or as Kate leads us, although all of those are important, but all of that is packaged with a community and fellowship 
that those pre that the preaching and worship is is held in, that it's held in the container and fellowship of 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 one another with the Holy Spirit, and that's another sermon, and I'm already starting down there, so I'll stop right now. When I was a kid, our family was always at church when the doors were opened. We actually had to be because we were the janitors, and if we weren't showing up, nobody else was getting in the doors either. This also meant, though, that we were the last ones to leave the church as well. As the introvert in our family, or at least one of the introverts in our family, um, this time after church was kind of like a black hole uh, for me. It was not something I looked forward to, and so I tended to go into the basement of the church, and I remember it just being a little dark down there, and I'd hang out in the basement until things cleared out upstairs. My brother Greg, who is certainly one of the extroverts in our family, always was the life of the party, and he was always hanging around with a group of guys um, older than himself who were just cracking up and hooting and hollering at his laughter and humor. It's one of the great gifts that my brother has. And then it was time to go home. Earlier this week, however, I heard that someone, um, some folks have been asking the question of whether or not Pastor Conrad has gone off the deep end. With all of the Facebook posts of the last four weeks, with the 29 podcast episodes that I've shared in the last two weeks, apparently that's not the way a kid who used to hang out in the dark basement is supposed to behave. I'm happy to say that, yes, indeed, after nearly 56 years, I have finally gone off the deep end, and I have found that the water is just fine in here, and I would welcome any of those who are worried about me to jump in and join me. For you see, it's actually an encouragement to me that after years of hanging out in the basement of fear and shame, someone has noticed that I've finally been set free. Hallelujah. Amen. Free to be who I was created to be. Free to be free about how important Jesus is to me. Free of the guilt that clung to me for so many decades. Free to be free of so much anxiety about what others care or think about me. Free of the basement where I hung out until the crowd went home. Free to be honest about my brokenness and my need of Jesus as my Savior. I'll tell you what, folks, if the freedom of the Holy Spirit means I've fallen off the deep end, then I can only tell you that I wish it had happened a whole lot sooner. I wish I had given up control sooner. I wish I had understood that God loved me beyond measure, as we're going to look at in a few moments. For understanding and being aware of God's love is the context in which, folks, we have a Pentecost experience. Not living in fear and anxiety like I did for so many years, that does not lead us to a Pentecost experience. A Pentecost experience of the Holy Spirit emerges out of our understanding and awareness of a deep love of God, and the two go hand in hand. Interestingly, in today's passage, falling off the deep end was also the accusation that was made of those who were touched by the coming of the Holy Spirit. Any journey from freedom to fear for the disciple Peter was also what he experienced. From the basement to a bully pulpit where he proclaimed that Jesus has come for all of us. For remember, it was literally just 53 days prior when around the fire in the dark, Peter denied Jesus three times. I don't know him. I never saw him. I never heard of him. I'm just warming my hands here, but thanks for asking anyway. Come on, Peter. You were with him last week. I saw you. I swear I, I saw you. Nope, I have no idea what you're talking. Come on, Pete. Let's just be honest. I am being honest. I never knew him. And then as the rooster crowed that night, the dark must have become even darker to Peter. Folks, I don't know for sure, but I wonder if Peter wasn't ashamed of being seen with Jesus, in part because he was just ashamed of being Peter. He was just ashamed of being seen at all. You see, hanging out in the basement, for me had nothing to do with being ashamed of Jesus. It had everything to do with being ashamed of me. We sometimes beat ourselves up so badly for saying that we're ashamed to be identified by Jesus. But sometimes I think the shame is something else as much as it is of Jesus. If not, it may not be about Jesus at all. It's simply shame about being who we are. Simply shame about who we've been created to be. If I could just hide, if, if no one could see me, if I could just be forgotten, if folks would just forget about me. Before we can be free to identify with Jesus, folks, we have, to be know, we have to know how much Jesus identifies us. Let me say that again. Before we can be free to identify with Jesus, we have to know how much Jesus identifies with us. 
Before we can preach the grace of Jesus, as Peter did so powerfully on Pentecost, we have to experience that grace ourselves. Something happened to Peter between Jesus' death and resurrection and Pentecost where he, come to, he came to understand the grace of God in a way that he had never understood it before. He came to understand that Jesus had forgiven him for denying him three times, that God had given him unmerited grace and favor and loved him when he denied him, after he denied him, and when he preached at Pentecost just as much as any other time. Since the coronavirus hit, I have been saying repeatedly that unless we are converted to Jesus in this crisis moment, we may never be converted again. Little did I know that four weeks ago when I sat down to write my weekly email, which is a regular thing for me, and entitled it, Why the Church Cannot Reopen, that over the next three weeks, God's Spirit would open heaven above me and give me a freedom to write and share openly and honestly so much about my understanding of God, my concerns for the church, childhood experiences that have shaped me, and on and on. What I experienced over the last four weeks was both freedom and release from fear and a greater sense of my identity in Christ than I've ever experienced in my life. Hallelujah. Amen. The different identities I've lived with, being a sociologist, being a professor, being a pastor, being a consultant, those public identities that I've negotiated and, and carefully merged, uh, carefully moved across sensitive to how people might see me in both of them, suddenly became merged into one over these weeks, and I found a wholeness and a healing in simply speaking what's been on my heart for so many years, regardless of who's listening and in whatever context I was in. And folks, that's a wholeness and a healing that only the Spirit can bring at a Pentecost moment. For me, the, weeks of, the last four weeks of falling off the deep end has meant falling into the depths of God's love in a way that I've never experienced before. Love that Paul actually prays for for the church of Ephesus. And a prayer, interestingly, that I have been praying for you as a congregation, for us as a congregation, for months, publicly and privately. I pray for you, says Paul, being rooted and established in love, that you may have the power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Something more than what's here. Something that is experienced here. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Listen to this, folks. If what Paul is describing in Ephesians 3, 17-19 isn't a Pentecost experience, then there isn't a Pentecost experience. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you would be rooted and grounded deeply in God's love. That you would have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. To know that love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Folks, this is, if we experience it, as much a Pentecost experience as there ever will be. And the incredible thing is that this experience is open to all of us who give our lives to Jesus Christ. I get a little tired of those with no Pentecost experience, like that experience of Ephesians 3, trying to tell the rest of us what Pentecost really looks like. And I get a little tired also of those who have a particular understanding of what Pentecost looks like, telling the rest of us that we don't know what they ha if we don't have what they have, we haven't experienced the Holy Spirit. Folks, the Holy Spirit has already come. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't need to wait for the Spirit to come again. And since the Spirit's coming is this coming of Jesus him Himself to us, and He tells us this, and Scripture is clear that the coming of the Spirit is the coming of Christ to us, when we give our lives to Christ, we receive the Spirit also. This is the greatest two-for-one package ever. In that moment when Christ comes into our heart, whether you're three years old or 300 years old, we have access to all that Ephesians 3 describes. We have access to God's love. We have access to power. We are rooted and deeply grounded in God's love. We experience the fullness of God. We have access to that as soon as we give our lives to Christ. In that moment, we experience or have the potential to experience not just then, because we might not say that felt like it then, but over time there is this ongoing Pentecost experience, there is this ongoing fire that burns within us that Paul continued to experience, because you're going to know and you're going to see later that Paul, not this morning, but some other time, that Paul continued to struggle 
despite the filling of the Holy Spirit and the coming of Pentecost. He's going to need to experience a Pentecost moment time and again. Paul's heart is burning for the church at Ephesus to experience the love of God as the metric of the fullness of God. The love of God as the measure of the fullness of God. For there is no difference between knowing and experiencing the love of God and Pentecost. If you look through the New Testament, there is not one particular way that we see the Spirit coming, that we see the Spirit manifesting itself upon people. There are a variety of ways. For the Spirit cannot be contained in a mathematical equation that we with rational minds and modernity want to make for the Spirit's coming. There's no particular equation for the Spirit's coming to us. And those who try to tell us so, that the Spirit comes in a particular way, are, the, are guilty themselves of trying to predict and control a Spirit that can neither be controlled nor predicted because the Spirit moves like the wind at the will of the Father, not at our will. The one requirement and only requirement is that we commit ourselves to knowing God and to that life with God that I have talked with you so often about. It was in those, li in those life with God moments at 5 a.m. on the porch that God met me in a new way in the last four weeks. But if I had not been practicing that life with God, I, I would have missed out. Folks, having our time with God isn't about fulfilling some law. It's about opening ourselves to the fullness of God's love to the depth and height and width and breadth of that love of God. That's all it is. It's not, an, it's not an act of obedience. It's an act of experiencing this incredible love of God that comes to us when we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. When we crack the door just a moment, just a little bit, as Laodicean church is invited to by Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, just crack the door. And I want to come in and eat with you. I want to come in and sup with you. I want to come in and drink coffee with you. So I want to say very clearly and unequivocally, once and for all, if you have received Jesus as your Savior, you have also received His Spirit in all of the fullness that is available to those who have received Jesus Christ. Because when we receive Jesus, we receive the Spirit of Jesus. It's not like these two are something different. As I said last week, I used to think these were two different species, Jesus and the Spirit. They're not, folks. Jesus says a number of times, when I, I will come to you. Do not doubt if you have received Jesus, you have received His Spirit. You now have access to all that Paul describes in Ephesians 3. Those gifts are yours and they're mine. And as we open ourselves to God's love, we will increasingly experience the Spirit of God over time. And it might take 56 years, but I'm telling you, it's worth all of the waiting in those mornings with God. For too long we have lived wondering, do I have the Spirit? Do I not have the Spirit? Have I received the Spirit? Have I not received the Spirit? Folks, the Spirit is not filling us with doubt. The enemy is filling us with doubt because it is our doubts and our fears and our anxieties that it gets in the way of the Spirit's coming. It did for me for 53 years. For too long we have lived wondering if we have the Spirit of God simply because someone with too much time on their hands decided, and perhaps someone with, who thought they were too important, decided that they would tell the rest of us poor souls what it looks like to have the Spirit of God. And that we were orphans until we had their experience. Folks, it's hogwash. Galatians 4 is clear. When you've received Jesus, you have received a Spirit, and you have access to Jesus and the Spirit and the Father to say, Daddy, Daddy, have mercy on me. Daddy, I'm broken. Daddy, I need you. Daddy, my life's out of control. Daddy, 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 we don't have to wait as children until we're 5 or 10 or 15 to say, Daddy, our little grandson Ezra, at 8, 9 months, started saying, Dada, Dada, Dada. Ezra didn't have to wait till he was good enough. Ezra didn't have to wait till he was grown up. Ezra didn't wait till he was mature enough. Ezra didn't wait till he had to behave well enough to say, Dada, Dada. And watching him this week in a video walk about six feet with his arms open into his daddy's arms who were wide open and hearing Jacob say, yes, Ezra, yes, way to go, Ezra, is a mirror image and picture of what God says to us when we come to him. 
You can do it, saint. You can do it. Just come here. Take those little baby steps. Take those little fledging steps. But I am here and the Spirit is here and it is all yours. Just come to me and let me wrap my arms around you, my child. No matter what anyone says, you are my child. No one, whatever anyone says, you have my spirit within you. No matter what anyone says, you have access to my love and the depth of my love. Fall into the deep with me, child. Fall into the deep with me, child. The water is fine in here. Folks, it's time to rebuke those voices and listen to the one who sent the Spirit and who is the Spirit, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the best two-for-one special ever. But folks, we can't experience the Spirit of God and the depth of God's love by hanging out in the kiddie pool. We can't experience the depths of His love in a shallow life with God that keeps me at the center and does everything to protect me and what I have and to cover up my brokenness and to wear a mask and to make people think I look good when in fact I look like trash inside. I can't receive God's love in its depth if I try to just keep everything controlled in my life and appear that I am in control when underneath I know I'm not. Folks, I only wish I had fallen off the deep end a long, long time ago. For those who think that falling off the deep end of the Spirit means that we have become ungrounded, Paul couldn't be more clear that those who experience the depth of God's love are also rooted and grounded in that love. There's something about falling into the depth of God's love. There's something about falling into the deep end of God's love that grounds us and roots us more deeply than we've ever been grounded and rooted before. For those who think I've fallen off the deep end because the Spirit of God has met me on my back porch at 5 a.m. over the last four weeks, I just want to say over and over again, I've never been more grounded in my life. I've never been more secure in my life not secure in who I am, but secure in my identity in Christ, who has wrapped his arms around me and as I walked toward him said, come on, son. Come on, son. Yay! You have made it! As we consider our text for today, what we find that Peter is also moved from fear to freedom as he experiences the coming of the Holy Spirit. From a dark fire where he denied his Lord to a pulpit where he freely declared the good news of Jesus and his Spirit. What we see in the Holy Spirit's coming is not only a release from fear and a new freedom for Peter and for others like him, I'm sure, but it also brought wholeness to a fractured and a fragmented world, bringing together those of many languages who were dispersed at Babel to hear one message of the depth of God's love and that one message across many languages. Those listening and watch scoffed at what they saw, why those followers of Jesus have finally, finally, finally gone off the deep end. They must indeed be drunk. But this is when Peter jumps in and says, no, no, folks. This is the outpouring of the Spirit that Joel promised a long, long time ago. That Joel saw on the horizon for the last days that God would pour out His Spirit on all people. On our sons and our daughters who will prophesy. On young men who will see visions. and old men who will dream dreams. And both men and women will... will And on both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Paul unequivocally, folks, declares that they were living in the last days in those hours after the spirit came. And if they were living in those last days 2,000 years ago, we are certainly living in those last days today. So why should we be surprised that from time to time a few of us would fall off the deep end into the love of God and into the depths of God, Spirit, and to the rest of folks look like somehow we've become ungrounded. The question is, why do we have to wait 56 years to experience this freedom and wholeness? And I just want to say to you, we don't. We don't have to wait this long. I waited this long because too long I listened to the lies of those around me who've constructed a particular way that the Spirit comes, and a particular way that the Spirit doesn't come. And I just want to say that as we open ourselves to God's love and as we open ourselves to God Himself, the Spirit comes to every one of us to the degree that we open ourselves up and create space for God's Spirit. I love how Paul describes Jesus in this passage in Acts 2. Exalted to the right hand of God, He received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Remember what I shared last week When we hear folks talking about the Spirit, 
I'm sorry, when we hear Jesus talking about the Spirit, we hear Him describing a Spirit, the Spirit as a gift, and almost like He can't wait to get back to heaven to the Father's right hand so that He can disperse that Spirit to the disciples as a gift. It's as if He was saying to them, and it seems to me that He is, it's going to be even better for you guys. It's going to even be better for you boys. It's going to even be better for you women. It's going to be even better for you children when I'm with the Father and the Spirit is with you. In fact, he says you're going to do greater things than I did. And so Peter describes that Jesus, now at the right hand of God, who received the fa- from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. And as I prepared last evening, I had this image of the Father holding in His hands this little, little white dove that represents the Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, wrapped and packaged in this little dove, and that He leans over gently and hands the Spirit to Jesus the Son and says, All right, Son, you've gone down. You've taken care of death. You've taken, taken care of the devil. You've taken care of eternal damnation. Now, release the Spirit, Son. Release our presence and our power into the world, into the broken world where death and resurrection have now been, have now been, dis, been destroyed and where you, my son, have, cl- have, have bent the clock back towards the beginning at Eden. And Jesus takes this little bird and he whispers, Go! Go, Spirit, go! Blow, Spirit, blow! Blow them into the deep end. Blow them back together. Blow them back to me. Daddy, Father, Daddy, Father, come on, my child, come back, come back, come back. And so the Spirit flies off, and the Spirit flies into our lives just as profoundly as at the day of Pentecost. Folks, it's not a big mystery. It's not a hard thing. We just say, come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. In meeting with the board this week in our beginning discernment of what needs to be reset as we reassemble, and folks, we will reassemble, but we're not going to reassemble without resetting what God tells us to reset. I shared with them that from the bottom of my heart and from Heidi, both of us together, that any resetting will begin with a new openness and awareness of the Holy Spirit in our fellowship together. A new understanding that we are not in control and we're not going to try to be. A new understanding that anything and everything we do must be aligned with what the Spirit is, ta- is saying to us, no matter how long we have to listen for what that alignment looks like. And while I sort of dreaded the Spirit's coming before COVID-19, afraid of what it would mean, afraid of loss of control, I no longer do. For these four weeks on the porch at 5 a.m., these writing of Facebook posts and podcast episodes have now helped me to realize that the opening of ourselves to this precious dove is simply the opening of ourselves to the greatest gift that God could give us. It's opening ourselves to His presence and to the joy and the love and the peace and the power and the wisdom and security and the firmest identity that is grounded in Him that we could ever have. Folks, when this happens to our congregation, many around us may well say, as has been said about me, did you hear about E-Town Mennonite Church? Them folks have fallen off the deep end. Them folks have fallen off the deep end. But the reality is, like Peter and others who experienced the Spirit on that Pentecost day, they and we will never be more solidly grounded in the deep end than we will be on that day when we experience the fullness of the love of God and our identity in Christ who has come to save us and to love us and to empower us and to just open His hands and say, Come on, Ezra. Come on, Ezra, you can do it. You can do it. Yay, Ezra! Yay, Ezra! For what appears to some like the deep end only appears that way because they haven't joined us yet. They haven't joined, jumped in yet. They haven't let con- go of control yet. And I don't say that critically because I was there. I've been there for 56 years. And thank God Pentecost isn't over for me. I'm a long way from perfect. I pray that the Holy Spirit continues to meet me for the rest of the life, my life until that dying day when I take my last breath, that the work of the Holy Spirit continues in me regardless of the cost because what we experience when we experience the depth of the love of God is worth anything we give up. In Ezekiel 47, the prophet speaks about 
the water that flows from the, under the temple threshold, from the temple threshold. And that water is ankle deep, and then that water gets knee deep, and then that water gets chest deep, and then we start to swim in that water. Folks, do you see what the Spirit's coming meant? It meant an ever-increasing flow that we are invited to walk in until we fall into the deep end and find that though we only can swim, the water is just fine and we are more deeply grounded and rooted than ever before because we're deeply grounded and rooted in the love of God. And that this water and flow is not just for us, but this passage makes it clear that this water is fresh and it makes fresh even the salt water. It makes fresh even the world around us. It brings life and, 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 and freshness and fruit to all that are around us. On both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because this water flows for them from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. Folks, there's an awful lot of healing that needs to happen in our land. But I want to say, as I've said again, it's not going to come by joining a political party. It's going to come by embracing the Spirit of God whose power makes any political party look like nothing. And I'm convinced that when we join a political party and, and give our allegiance to that political party, there is a spirit that captures our souls that is anathema to the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God said, came as an advocate for us. As I said last Sunday, why in the world would we be looking for the government to give us advocacy? We as Anabaptists have known since 500 years ago that there is no advocacy better and greater and more secure than the Spirit of God. This is our one advocate, and we must not look elsewhere. And I'm convinced the longer we look to others for our advocacy, the longer we delay the Spirit's coming into our own experience. The longer we look to others for our security, the less we look to the Spirit. Jesus made it clear you can't serve God and mammon. And Jesus, I think, would, I think a parallel passage, I think a parallel way of saying that is you can't have Pentecost and politics at the same time. Come on, folks. There ain't nothing like what the Spirit has to offer us that the government and politics have to offer us this, this election year. This is going to fade so quickly, this life. These momentary trials are going to become nothing so soon compared to the glory of God that awaits those of us who open themselves to the Spirit's coming and to the depth and mystery of the love of God. Folks, I have fallen off the deep end. And my prayer is that you will join me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the, G you are the God of the deep end. You're the God of the depth of your love. You're the God of the water that rises so far we have to start swimming in it. But when we swim, we find that we've never been more firmly grounded and deep, grounded and rooted in you. And I just pray for this congregation. I pray for every listener who hears your word this morning, that they would just open themselves to your love, that they would just see you like they see my, our son Ezra, our son Jacob, holding his arms wide open to his little boy at 10 months old and saying, come on, boy, come on, son, you can do it. Just Get those little legs moving. Fling those arms of yours through the air. And when you get here, I'm going to wrap my arms around you and I'm just going to say, yay. Yay, you did it. And I'm going to hold you close to my heart. Oh, God, make this a reality among all of us in, this day of, uh, in these days of turmoil and tragedy. Embrace us cause us to come to you to experience that embrace that you are have for us come holy spirit come come holy spirit come amen